Good evening. This is Commissioner Melissa Bynum. It appears that we have our standing committee members in place and staff in place, and it's five o'clock. If there's anything that would prevent us from starting at this time, uh, would someone from staff please let me know? Otherwise, we'll get going. Commissioner, we are live on YouTube as well as UGTV. Thank you so much. Good evening, my name is Melissa Bynum. I'm the commissioner at large for District 1, chairing Public Works and Safety Standing Committee for Monday, October 25, 2021. And before I call the meeting to order, I want to announce that due to COVID-19, some committee members, staff and public are attending remotely by Zoom as well as some on site. All participants joining remotely should mute their phones or computers when not speaking to avoid background noise. During the meeting, make sure you announce yourself by name and title when you speak so the public knows who's speaking. This is critical given the number of remote participants. It's also current guidance from our Kansas Attorney General. The public is allowed to participate by Zoom or submit comments by email prior to the meeting. And those comments are included in the record of the meeting. The public may also indicate their intent to provide remote public comment by contacting our clerk's office by 5 p.m. the Thursday before our meeting. And the public also has an opportunity to provide brief comments either by phone or Zoom from the lobby of our municipal office building. I will now call the meeting of Public Works and Safety Standing Committee to order. Would the clerk call the roll, please? Roll call, Groneman. Present. Philbrook. Here. Kane. Here. Ramirez. Here. Markley. Here. Bynum. Here. We do not have revisions to our agenda tonight. And our first order of business is we do have minutes to approve from two meetings, July 26 and August 23. Motion for name, move for approval. Thank you. Second. Ramirez, second. We have a motion and a second for approval of our minutes. Could we have roll call, please? Yeah. Roll call, Groneman. Aye. Philbrook. Aye. Kane. Aye. Ramirez. Aye. Markley. Aye. Bynum. Aye. And our minutes are approved. Thank you, committee. First item on our agenda tonight is a responsible bidder ordinance amendment. This is one of five items on this agenda tonight. Um, item one is an ordinance that amends the definition of responsible bidder. And I see we have Susan Alleg from our legal department here. Ms. Alleg, I'll turn that over to you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, my name is Susan Alleg from the legal department. And um, this item is a simple change to the way that our code defines responsible bidder simply to add the word safety to the ordinance. Um, that would permit the unified government to adopt a standard operating procedure that would require that um, vertical construction contracts worth more than $325,000 um, include a policy to prevent drug and alcohol abuse on site and also require that um, on-site workers have obtained their OSHA 10 cards, which is just a certification that they've received 10 hours of safety training. Um, this is supported by the Greater Kansas City Building and Construction Trades Council. And we have Joe Hudson here from um, the Carpenters Regional Council to answer questions you may have. We also have um, Sharon Reed and Richard Rocha from UG Purchasing to answer questions that you have um, in terms of how this will function. Thank you very much. I, first of all, thank you, Joe, for taking time to be here with us tonight on this item. And my question is for staff. I read this item on the agenda, but I want to clarify, this would be for a project that the unified government would let. Is that correct? That's correct. 
and it applies to sealed bids. What other questions or comments do we have? And Mr. Hudson, I would give you the floor if you wanted to make any comments, but let's first check with our committee. Well, we, they've been working on this for a heck of a long time and it simplifies our process and makes it better for us. Thank you, Commissioner. Other comments from the committee members? If not, Joe Hudson, I would let you unmute and make any comments you like, please. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, very simply, right, this adds a little bit of a safety standard uh, for uh, workforce that would work on uh, unified government projects as well as uh, an 11 panel drug test just to make sure that the uh, folks aren't uh, using drugs and alcohol on the work sites. Uh, we think it's uh, a simple ask uh, that the contractors that work for the unified government have uh, safe and drug free workers. It's uh, as simple as that. Uh, we, we also were through the discussions very conscious of uh, smaller uh, contractors, in particular M and WBE contractors. Uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons why we came up with the 325,000 uh, kind of floor for um, the bid process. Uh, so this would only affect projects that uh, would hit that $325,000 plus uh, for vertical construction. And I'd stand for questions if there is any. Any questions? or Mr. Hudson or anybody else on this item. Um, is there anyone else attending that would like to make any comment? I don't see any, Madam Clerk. Did we have any comments from the public? No comments were received. Commissioner Mike Kane, move for approval. Correctly, sir. I have a motion and a second from Commissioner Markley. Uh, if there's no further discussion, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Roll call, Groneman. Aye. Philbrook. Aye. Kane. Aye. Ramirez. Aye. Markley. Aye. Bynum. Aye. And that motion carries. Thank you all to everyone that worked on that. I really appreciate it. I think that will be very helpful going forward. Thanks for all your time on it. The second item is a request to apply for an EDA grant uh, for a public safety training facility. And this is a, a huge deal. We have Chief Jack Andrade here, I think. I'm not sure I saw him. Hi, how are you? There you are. Got the team there. Uh, I know you're going to bring us a presentation on this grant. So I will turn the floor over to you. That's correct. Good evening. My name is Jack Andrade, I'm the first deputy fire chief for KCKFD. To the left of me, I have Scott Shoneman, battalion chief of training, Brent Smith, assistant chief of logistics. I have Erica Hupka and Jeff Stevens from iParametrics. They helped us with the grant uh, that we call Collider for Intelligent and Resilient Communities. And I'm going to show you a PowerPoint presentation. This first started back in uh, 2018 when we realized that we needed to, to figure out a way to get our training division out, out of the basement. And what we started doing is looking at Oklahoma and, and um, Cal or Colorado at, at facilities that they had. And we partnered up with Kansas City, Kansas Police Department, and we went to those two states and realized that we were deficient in several areas, not only in, in KCK, but in the region. And so we started looking over and researching uh, other facilities over the, the, uh, the nation and realized that there's some key components that were missing. One is a training, a training administration center that holds at auditorium and classrooms uh, for large large groups of people. Within inside that 
facility. We would also have uh, administration offices. Other components would be skid pads, driving tracks for PD, burn buildings, and situational and practical buildings for both fire and police departments. Here we have a site plan in the middle left side of the, the uh, slide, you have a, a training administration building that is approximately uh, 100,000 uh, 100, square feet. Um, we also, along with the, the rest of the site plan, involves all the discipline that the fire department uh, trained on, but we do not have adequate space or props to do so. And that, if you look uh, along that picture, you have Swift Water Rescue at the top. Right below it is canine facility, then training center. You have confined space, trench rescue, uh, railroad cars. We have the second largest uh, railroad depot in the nation. And so we, we need somewhere to be able to handle those types of emergencies. Just below that are strip malls and a shooting range indoor and outdoor for the police department. At the very bottom of the page, you have Safety Town, which is for our community. <clears throat> As we start talking about Safety Town, this, this building is, we envision it to, to, we envision that all school districts in the metro will utilize this facility. This will help assist uh, the school children to learn about life safety training and education. This mock town for kids could bring uh, bicycle safety, crosswalk safety, fire safety, railroad safety, self-defense classes, along with technology, drones and robotics, and, and information for uh, school-age kids and college kids on trades. So mechanical, electrical technology, um, and so on and so forth. We will also teach first aid and stop, drop, and roll classes at this facility. As we started looking at this vision prior to the Build Back Better grant, we realized it was going to bring, um, we, we were needing money. And we looked at other grants, but nothing really fit until the, the Economic Development Administration put together a grant. Uh, that they released about two months ago. It's called Build Back Better Regional Challenge. And it, it was a grant so that we would bring the underserved and underemployed communities uh, to lead them to, to more jobs. And so what, what better way to do that by, by uh, posing a training facility based on education? There's two phases to this grant. The first phase we submitted uh, in October 19, 2021, and it was to try to receive $500,000 to uh, help us with the technical, tech, technical assistance funds to develop and support the projects that are in this grant. The second phase, which is due March 15th, uh, could bring up to $100 million to implement those projects. What we realized as we started going through this grant process is that building partnerships and coalitions with members from the community is that everybody started dreaming bigger. It was no longer about re the regional training facility for public service, but it was for all community all communities within Wyandotte County and the region. This was going to help to lead the jobs. One component to help with this is to find a way to, to get the underserved to come to those this educational site. Um, we, we met with individuals from the community and they said we needed a daycare facility. And so at this site, we wrote language to have that type of facility at this at this place. 
technology. We met with KCKCC and UMKC, um, and we realized that we need to try to, to ramp up the awareness of technology that is, um, that is developed in the KC, KC metro area. Transportation is one project as well uh, in this, that's written in this grant to try to get individuals from the downtown area to, to that training location, whether it's to KCKCC, this training hub, or the downtown campus that Kansas City, Kansas Community College is, is envisioning. So we get to the grant piece, which is called the Collider for Intelligent and Resilient Communities. iParametrics has come up with great language that is, is, that is detailed on, on the screen in front of you. We can't thank them enough uh, for, for the work that they've done. Education is the a, is a foundation for this grant and it's going to help lead the jobs, it's going to help the underserved, and it's going to help the unemployed. It's also going to help the trades industries uh, bring individuals to our facility to, to teach them how to, how to build a home. Um, and it is going to also allow the fire department to show them how, to, how building construction is done on a house, and then we can also go ahead and tear that house down and, and then have them redevelop it uh, next semester. So I mentioned coalition partners. It took a lot of individuals to, to envision this type of work this, in this grant. And these are our coalition members. These individuals will, will assist us in phase two to, to define the grant more more so for phase two. These groups on the right hand side are our industrial leaders leadership. There, there will be committees that will be formed by, by members of each one of these groups to help us figure out how, how this um, facility is going to be built and what, what facilities need to be at this at this uh, at this hub, we had several letters of support, and they continue to pour in. Um, there are individuals that are not on here. Um, that's just because we have so many coming in from uh, a four region or a four state area: Iowa, South Dakota, Missouri, and Oklahoma. And so. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to the team to see if there's anything that uh, they would like to speak on. I'll just say that you know I think this is a it's a big project. It's going to help a lot of people out. It's you know, and, and I'm really excited about it. Good for public safety. It's going to give us an opportunity to have the training grounds that we need. Um, it's good for uh, the the private industries that are going to partner with us. It gives them an opportunity to have a have a place where they can test and and uh, market their their new equipment um it's good for the the community um that want to um, go to school get a better education get a good paying job um and, and really it's gonna be good for the children as well with that safety town uh, it's gonna help bring in the kids from all over the all over the school ages um every single year it's gonna bring them to this facility and um it's going to help give them a better appreciation. It's going to give them some options, some ideas, and hopefully it's going to be a long-term recruiting effort for not only public safety, but all the, also the trades industries. Um, and just the timing's right. If this, um, with the grant that can help facilitate the, the payment of all this, um, I think that that's just a, it's just a icing on top of the cake. So I'm super excited about it. And I think it's going to be a great thing for Wanda County. Thank you. This is Commissioner Bynum. To the gentleman who just spoke, if you would introduce yourself, name and title, and then as you all continue to speak, would you introduce yourself, name and title when you are given your comments? Thanks. Absolutely. My name is Brent Smith. I'm the Assistant Chief of Support Services. Thank you. Thank you. 
My name is Erica Hupka, and I am the Director of Training and Exercise at iParametrics. And the vision that this group brought together to bring this to be a whole of community approach uh, to this opportunity is phenomenal. And I think that this is going to be leading edge, not only for our region, but also for the country. I think that this, if we are able to get this up and off the ground, I think this will be where people will come to see how best practices are made. And that's all that we have. Are there any questions? Questions from the committee for the presenters or comments? Got a comment. Go right ahead, Commissioner. If, if you go back and just look at the list of the people that have supported this, you know, and I worked in safety for 21 years and I had to fly to Michigan on a regular basis to get my training. No one would have, the, the, the travel would be reduced. The, if you put it in the right spot, you, you've got transportation, you've got opportunities for the kids, which I've been talking about for a long time. Training, 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 you never do enough training. You know, this facility is, isn't gonna be just good for the public works, it's gonna be good for the entire community. This will bring hotels, this will bring more job opportunities, this will be a, a shining star for Wyandotte County. I, I think it's important that we get behind projects like this. I, in the 16 and a half years I've been there, I've never seen that many people on the list support anything. And that's a large amount of money. And, and there's no better way, and I've said this all along, we have the best workforce in Wyandotte County than you can possibly imagine. And why not bring more people, add more jobs, and provide jobs for people that don't have them? Very well said, Commissioner Kane. I appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, Commissioner Bynum. And just second the words of Commissioner Kane. You know, when I when I met with Jack and Drani and the team um, about this project beforehand, <clears throat> I was amazed of how many people have come together on this. It, it, it's amazing. And I told, you know, since last year, our workforce is changing and we need to we need to catalyze on that and that this is an opportunity to do that. Uh, and going back to what Commissioner Kane said, we have a lot of talent here in Wyandotte County and we need to tap into that. We need to hone into it. And so but thank you, uh, Deputy Chief, for everything you and your team, everything and all of the partners who have come together on this. Um, this is what this is what happens when Wyandotte County comes together, when we actually sit down at the table together and work and be passionate about it. This is what can happen. And so I'm very happy that this has happened. And I look forward to seeing this project um, go to the next step. Thank you. Commissioner Mike Kane, move for approval. Thank you. Is there a second? Mark Lisa. We have a motion and a second on the item, a comment and a question. First of all, uh, sincere thanks to everyone, all of the partners and everyone with the UG. It, it was a very heavy lift uh, to pull this grant together. And I think I can speak on behalf of the entire committee when I say thank you to each and every individual on staff who had a hand in making sure this was submitted on time. And the question is the approval that we are giving, is it for us to move forward in round two as well as this initial round one, or will we need to come back to this body uh, once we make it into the round two category? Commissioner Bynum, this is um, Melissa Sieben, Assistant County Administrator. I would definitely see us coming back um, round two um, simply um, because there's a lot more that goes into the, the next phase that's a planning phase. And so there's a lot more that is going to be happening that we absolutely would want to share with you. So um, Jack's team, as well as the other coalition partners, would definitely be wanting to share what we're submitting. Okay, and that deadline is March 15. So I'm going to imagine that 
you would make your way back to this committee sometime in February at our February meeting, I imagine. Um, no further comments. Are there any comments from the public, Madam Clerk? I just wanted to, Commissioner Bynum, make a quick clarification. We're submitting this and only if we're approved will there be a March um, timeline, um, I guess we'll say when we're approved. Correct, that's why I'm, I'm manifesting. Um, Madam Clerk, are there any comments from the public on the item? No comments were received. Thank you. I would call the roll, please. Roll call, Groneman. Groneman. Aye. Philbrook. Aye. Kane. Aye. Ramirez. Aye. Markley. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Thank you so much. Motion carries. The third item is a request for approval to create a grant funded program coordinator position within our uh, Kansas City, Kansas Police Department Victim Services Unit. Wendy Medina is here and I will turn the floor to Wendy to present this item, please. Thank you, Commissioner. Again, my name is Wendy Medina and I'm the program supervisor of the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department's Victim Services Unit. Um, and we are here today to request approval to create a new position within our unit for a program coordinator to lead a project um, that we are piloting here in our city. So um, the Kansas Office of the Governor received a federal grant um, called Improving Criminal Justice Responses to Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence, Dating Violence and Stalking, um, awarded by the Federal Office on Violence Against Women. So the, the Kansas Governor's Grants Office, I'm going to call it the KGGP for short, is um, the primary fis fiscal and a programmatic agent for the grant project. They received um, this fund and they've chosen our community uh, where they're gonna implement this project. So the intent of it is to build a statewide framework that enhances capacity and informs the criminal justice system in the state of Kansas, aiming to enhance response to high-risk offenders and high-risk um, groups. So the project team members so far are comprised of the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department, the Wyandotte County District Attorney's Office, the Municipal Court, the Order Protection a Judge, the Municipal, Prosecu the municipal Prosecutor Judge, um, our Area Domestic Violence Shelter, Friends of Yates, um, and other community agencies that work with victims of domestic violence and abusers. All of these folks have already come to the table um, and are on board and um, collaborating on this project. And we've um, signed an MOU, all of like the leadership and the agencies that I've mentioned um, have come together and agreed. And basically what we're gonna be doing in our city or wanting to is implement a lethality assessment um, program so that when officers are responding to domestic violence and sexual assault and stalking type calls, um, not only are they doing their reports as usual, but they implement this additional lethality assessment, which is essentially a list of questions, maybe 10 or 11, that will assess the risk of a domestic violence victim. Um, and if they score high, then um, it would trigger the response team, all these people that I just named, um, so they, that the victim can receive supportive services sooner than later. Um, and this is something that, like I said, the KGGP has funding for, and because they've chosen our community as a pilot, um, the pilot community, they are um, willing to invest up to $96,000 in a program coordinator position. And we think it would be ideal for it to come from the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department, just because we already have a victim services unit in place. Um, additionally, uh, we also want to hire, hire a response advocate, but Friends of Yates, the domestic violence shelter, um, they are taking the lead on creating that position over there. So I think it would be strategic um, if we at uh, the police department can create this new position that's gonna be 100% grant funded 
um, through the KGG Peace Office. Um, very similar to the VOCA grant that I um, come before you every year about um, where the positions are grant funded and they uh, reimburse um, that, that position and um, helps with all the supplies, all the travel and training. Um, and we have, a, we have approval and support from our chief and from all the members of this uh, response team that we wanna create. Um, but of course, before we move forward with trying to create the position, um, we would request your approval. Thank you, Ms. Medina. I really appreciate the explanation. Are there questions or comments from the committee members? Anyone have a question or comment? I do have one question. The position, would that be a person who is employed by the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department? Yes, ma'am. The duration I see in our packet looks to be through September of 22, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And the goal is that once we built this, um, we implement this pilot program, if we wanna continue it, there might be opportunities to um, keep that position on, whether it be through um, additional grants from the KGGP or even um, by requesting it to our VOCA grant. So okay. there's opportunity for keeping it and transitioning it out of um, this pilot program. Thank you very much. Other questions or a motion? Move to approve. Romero, second. Thank you very much. We have a motion and a second. I'll ask Madam Clerk, did we receive any comments from the public on the item? No comments were received. Thank you very much. Roll call, please. Roll call, Groneman. Aye. Philbrook. Aye. Kane. Aye. Ramirez. Aye. Markley. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Thank you. The motion carries. Appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Medina. Thank you. Item four is levy betterments, an overview for betterments in the levy trail system. I will recognize Assistant County Administrator Melissa Sieben. And Melissa, I'm going to start with a question for you. Our, our agenda indicates it's a voting item. Is that correct? Yes, it is. OK, thank you. I'll hand the floor to you. All right, thank you. And can everybody see my screen, Commissioner Bynum? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. It's a little different um, when I'm not on two monitors. Well, thank you everyone for having me here tonight. Melissa Steven, Assistant County Administrator. Um, tonight, I also have Sarah White uh, with me as well. Um, primarily, we're here tonight because um, we came in 2019, it's been a while back, where we talked about some betterments that we were going to want to do, um, which is a core terminology um, on this massive um, uh, $500 million levy project. The, the goal was um, to improve our public facilities. Um, part of that was our levy pump stations, um, where in which two of them are Argentine and Strong Avenue Station. Um, and our Armourdale, um, where we wanted to basically enhance our capacity to um, exceed, um, far exceed where they're at today. And those um, are actually underway. Um, if you drive the 18th Street Bridge, you can see some of that work going on behind our newer public safety um, center that we have. And um, the other one um, is maybe a little more difficult to, to notice, but we are definitely underway with that work. Um, and the contractors actually kicked off um, their work today um, on the Le Levy's project itself. Um, I'm going to go ahead and transition to the next slide. So again, just the scale of this work starting down where the Kansas and Missouri River meet and clear over um, on the far western border just past K32 crossing of the Kansas River. Um, and um, what's significant here is um, the fact that along this entire stretch, um, we are going to be adding 17 miles of levee trail surface. So basically what betterments are, is there an opportunity for us to be able to um, add things to the construction contract at the buying power of the project? 
and to do things above and beyond what the federal government is providing to um, the partners on this project, KCMO, Ka Valley, and the unified government, and also kind of the partnership on surrounding developments that we're currently working on. So things that are already committed through this, as I mentioned earlier, are the upgrades to the Armordale and Argentine um, pump stations to improve stormwater management behind the levees. Um, and then a sluice gate, which if anyone's interested in what that is, it's a small dollar value um, relative to the overall project of about $100,000, as well as the levee trail enhancements, um, which are around 2.7 million. So you can kind of see um, just under 3 million for those. Um, and the bulk of, of those costs um, are the levee surface um, trail improvements, as well as the gates to keep pedestrians safe and not allow vehicular traffic, which we're currently um, struggling with. Again, um, just our levee trail network as proposed. There's been a multitude of de design shreds on this engagement with the Armordale master plan um, and um, just a ton of, of work to get and solicit feedback. What we're gonna be basically focusing on tonight is the area of focus that we've discussed with you um, over the last couple of months um, around the area where the Yards 2 project here is, which is um, the kind of the orangish color, the green color, and then on the north side, this Ha future development property, um, as well as on the, the what would be the concerned the west side um, at the base of the, the bridge here where we would have a trail um, connection. Any questions so far on what I'm going to be talking about? Okay. So basically what we're seeking approval for tonight, um, in addition to uh, what we already have committed on the levy betterments of the, the 17 miles of trail surface and security gates are the second two items that are underlined, which is the connectors that we need up to the bridge to be able to cross the river. And I'm referring to the Rock Island Bridge. And that is a $1.2 million. And that is part of our development agreement on the Rock Island Bridge. And then also um, just the, the commitment for the, the earthen work and uh, base plantings um, for the public park that would be on that east side that I pointed out with yards to the, the Bill Haw property. So it's a limited scope. This is not full development of everything that we may have shown you in pictures. It's simply to get the site grading in place and to get the connections for the trail to um, exist um, on both sides of the river. And this is kind of a schematic of the betterments budget that um, we submitted um, for approval back in April of 2019. Um, it was $10 million that we needed and you can kind of see the drawdowns. The POs are simply um, things that we've had to pay out um, to the core and that's kind of a, a little bit of a moving target at this point, but for um, trying to see if there's hazardous waste, things of that nature. And then the pump station upgrades here at $1.3 million. Um, for the Armordale CID and the $1 million for the, um, um, I'm sorry, for the, uh, the Strong Avenue. A trails, the sluice, sluice gate. So you, um, when you get through all of that, um, what we're looking at is um, a remaining um, amount that we're requesting in yellow for the public trailhead park and the connection up to the Rock Island Bridge. Currently, um, we have shown you quite a bit of information um, around future improvements, and I wanted to give you kind of an idea of what lies ahead should the governing body choose to move forward with some of this in the future. This is our Armor, Armordale Trailhead Park um, that is sitting on the, the west side there, and you can see that we would have um, some parking and other um, park-like amenities that would come along with that to connect to the bridge and basically people a spot to park and then go um, further westward on the trails. And then there's another six million, almost seven million dollars in estimated cost to actually improve on the riverside of the levees, um, which is kind of like this amphitheater style seating um, that you could see um, on either side of the river, as well as kind of access to the water for boat docks and things of that nature but none of that is in the current dollars we're looking to spend. 
And recently, um, we have been um, gifted um, or in the process of receiving a gift of property um, that's here inside the Red Triangle for the development of the, the park there along, um, along the river. And we've tentatively shown possibility that you could fit a soccer field in there or other type of things um, for park amenities. But again, that is not part of the cost that we're asking to have approved tonight. And lastly, this is just kind of the schematic that we've also seen from the, the Kansas City um, the Design Center about what could future happen um, on the west side. And um, that's why we're seeking to, um, I'm gonna stop my screen share, seeking approval on those, um, those betterments um, for the connection up to the trail uh, or to the bridge and um, for um, getting the surface in for the public park on the east side. Sarah, is there anything you would like to add? I think, Melissa, this is all really great. Um, the only thing I would say, you know, is the opportunity is really now for these items because of the, the levees project um, and um, with the opportunity to add these in as a betterment and the um, cost reduction that we'll get by using the contractor that is out there. And, you know, really um, their schedule is, Set on when they're going to be working here, and this is our opportunity to do those items. Yeah, with the contractor kicking off in this area, that does create um, a need for us to be able to move forward with full design um, on the connections up to the bridge, as well as the um, basically the leveling out for the, the future public park on the east side. Thank you both uh, for the information and the presentation, Melissa. Are there comments or questions from the committee members? Commissioner Merkley. Thanks, Commissioner. So Melissa, can you just talk briefly about how the Rock Island Bridge Agreement interacts with this agreement and what our obligation is under that agreement and how this might aid in that? Well, my understanding, and, and Sarah probably knows it a slight bit better than me because she uh, worked with it as well, but basically in there, we said we would provide the connections up to the bridge. This is nothing on the bridge. It's connections up to the bridge as part of that agreement. And so this is a result of that um, work that then allows us, regardless of what happens, to be able to use this as a trail crossing in the future. Right. So on both sides of the bridge, there's actually, the walls are being raised. Um, and so this, this access right now uh, up to the bridge um, doesn't quite exist. So this is something that we would need to build for any kind of uh, crossing of the bridge um, with or without the uh, development. Commissioner Markley, does that answer your question? I think so. Comment for Melissa and or Sarah. It strikes me that what you're describing is an opportunity basically for us to capitalize on the more than 500 million levy investment that's occurring. And if I heard you correctly in the presentation, the commission, the governing body authorized the up to 10 million in 2019. And you are now requesting use of a portion of that 10 million that's been authorized. Am I correct? Yeah, and I would, I would just go ahead and explain it this way. When we did that, we came as a very kind of generic statement of public facilities, <clears throat> knowing that we were, you know, looking at a whole bunch of um, stuff along the river in that area, and it was just starting to formulate, but we didn't really know. We also knew that we had an opportunity with these pump stations as well. So there, we had a general clause in there that um, Kathleen and her folks, um, when they did the bond issuance, helped us write about public facility improvements, um, and as well as the trail. So 
again, we didn't quite know where we were going to be at the time when we started this three years ago now, which is hard to believe it's been that long. But um, when the bill was authorized in 2018, we were kind of caught back because we thought this was a 30 year march that we were on. So um, it was it's been good that we've had access to these funds. We've used them kind of rolling for our property acquisition. So First, we, you know, easements and any takings we had to do. Luckily, we only had to do two, which we've updated um, maybe the full commission on or a committee I can't remember anymore. But what I can tell you is, is that it's left us with money to be able to do this kind of work without having to seek any additional dollars um, that haven't already been allocated. All right, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? If not, I would seek a motion, please. Move to approve, Ramirez. Correctly, second. We have a motion and a second. Is there, Madam Clerk, is there anyone in the attendees or, or did you receive any communication on the item? No comments were received. I don't see anyone with their hand up asking to speak. Okay, thank you very much. Roll call on the item, please. Roll call, Groneman. Aye. Silbrook. Aye. Kane. Aye. Ramirez. Aye. Markley. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Thank you very much. Melissa and Sarah, thank you both very much. Again, another item where I think there's been a ton of heavy lifting, uh, pun intended, and so our sincere thanks to you and everyone that's had a hand in bringing this forward. Um, let's see here. I believe that brings us to item five, our last item for public works and safety. It is a public works quarterly report. I know I'm excited. Um, anytime we get to hear from public works is a good day. Jeff. Fisher is our director of public works, and I think there are other members of his team online as well. But Mr. Fisher, I'm going to turn this to you. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Commissioner Bynum, and good evening. <clears throat> this is a new habit for public works. This will be the first night that we will report to you on a quarterly basis for the foreseeable future. As you know, public works covers a lot of ground in the organization and in the community, and you know, from wastewater to stormwater, engineering, buildings, uh, trash and recycling, fleet, streets, um, a lot a lot of work going on in the community. And so uh, per the direction of the county administrator, Doug Bach, we're going to do this on a quarterly basis. And I think it'll have a lot of benefits. It'll be a good opportunity to highlight things that are going on uh, at the time and uh, educate the uh, public. Um, you know, I think a few of you know how uh, important culture is to the public works department. We spend a lot of time on it and uh, spend a lot of time on leadership development. And one thing that uh, we wanted to highlight, uh, we recently committed to American Public Works Association's accreditation process. There are only about 200 cities in all of North America that are accredited. Um, so we intend to, to be one of those. It'll take us a few years to get through the self-assessment process. Um, and, and then APWA will call in the review team and, and uh, see how we're doing. Yeah, I expect we'll do well. Uh, we did do something a little bit different and unique, I think, in the world of accreditation and how we identified our team. Uh, we requested from everybody in public works who had any interest in leading it or having a team approach to the self-assessment accreditation process to submit applications, resumes. And then we had a uh, body of uh, teammates meet with those, interview them, and then selected the one they thought was best fit. And uh, we do have that team identified. Pretty excited about it. And uh, so we'll start that. We've already started it. And like I said, it'll probably take two to three years to, to get through that. And I expect to be accredited within that three, three and a half years. Uh, just because I know our teams, um, they're ready for it. One of the things, too, that I'm real excited about is our roundtable, our leadership roundtables. Um, our outstanding office manager, Diana Jimenez, uh, is largely responsible for coordinating those and, and uh, making sure they go well. And they've been 
very well received by the team. I'm going to hand that over to Diana. Hi, Commissioners. It's Diana Jimenez, um, Public Works Office Manager. Um, Public Works has held uh, roundtable sessions to de develop leaders at all levels. Um, these sessions are a way to create a special and safe environment for the team to share information and ideas. It's also a way to educate on important topics such as performance reviews, customer service, taking extreme ownership, and the impor importance of leadership. Thank you. Thanks, DJ. This is Dave Reno, Public Works' Community Engagement Officer. Uh, in addition to the programs like the roundtable, one of the simplest things that we can do to build great teams really is to recognize our coworkers for their hard work. So a pat on the back can go a long way to improving culture. And that's exactly what our employee recognition uh, pilot at Water Pollution Control does. Uh, we just kicked this off and it's straightforward. When somebody sees their teammate going above and beyond at their job or above and beyond for our residents, they can fill out a form and then recognize that individual for their outstanding work. It's a special program in that we haven't done this before and we really do, we look forward to expanding it across public works uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Jeff Miles, fleet manager. I'm honored to speak on the infrastructure committee as well as serve on the committee as well. This initiative was suggested by the mayor, is broken up in, into three special subcommittees. The first is street, bridges, and uh, street lights. The second is parks and buildings. And the third is storm and sewer. Committees include special team members from all divisions of public works, along with three commissioners, three to four commissioners on each subcommittee. Our vision is to focus on special outcomes, outputs, and strategies. We meet, uh, our subcommittees meet once a week and then every two weeks with commissioners. And we do appreciate all the commissioners for their dedication to their time and their contributions to these subcommittees. Tours of our community was done in September that took it out of the room setting to actually out in our community to see some of these special hurdles that we run into day to day. Thank you. Good evening, this is Jonathan Wiles, Project Manager, Stormwater Division, Public Works. Um, as you're aware, 2021 um, Public Works staff worked with the governing body to modify and strengthen the Unified Government's Municipal Code Chapter 8 as it pertained to the erosion and sediment control. These modifications and updates provided a triple point benefit. First, it supported a clean and maintained community during development, uh, residential and commercial activities. Uh, second, it partners with developers and builders alike through a special abatement process. This limits the slowing or stopping of the construction process. And then third, it meets state and federal requirements related to the unified government's municipal separate storm sewer system, uh, the NPDES program, the National Pollution Discharge Elimination uh, Permit. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Joe Barnes. I'm a project manager with Water Pollution Control and I wanted to give an update on the Walcott expansion. So as part of this expansion, it, it's comprised of three major components. One is a, a new influent pump station. Two is a four mile uh, gravity sewer line to connect to, the, to our brand new um, wastewater treatment plant. And that's the most special one we wanted to talk about tonight. Um, this, this wastewater treatment plant is gonna be open in the next 30 days. It's the fifth of its kind in the United States. And it's the first in the state of Kansas to have this aerobic granular sludge technology. Um, so we're really excited to, to be in the, the forefront of technology. Um, this also gives us an opportunity for growth in our Western portion of our county. And um, I, I just wanted to also mention that we are gonna have the ribbon cutting Wednesday at 1030. So October 27th at 1030 on the site. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. This is Jonathan Gutierrez, the Solid Waste Division Program Manager. So this evening, I wanna talk about a special event that we held this past weekend, we referred to as Dumpster Days. It was our first ever community-wide electronics, recycling, and bulky, bulky item disposal event. And why did this matter? This is an event that allowed our residents to come and get rid of unwanted trash, bulky items, and also allowed our residents to dispose of uh, e-waste or electronic waste in a responsible manner. And then finally, it allowed our residents or to deal with an issue here 
within our Wyandotte County and our region when it comes to illegal dumping. And from this event, I just had uh, a few stats that I wanted to, uh, to mention from our weekend event. We had 666 visitors to this event. In that event, we filled 20 dumpsters on an average of four tons per dumpster. So that was a total of 80 tons or about 160,000 pounds was collected. On our electronic waste, we had 51 pallets that were collected. That included 100 TVs and then additional electronic waste of about 16,821 pounds or 84 tons that was diverted from going into a landfill. And then finally at this event, we partnered with a nonprofit group called Avenue of Life. And Avenue of Life has a recycling mattress program it provides jobs to individuals here locally. And from this event, we had seven truckloads of recycled mattresses on that equivalent of 206 mattresses or about 21,000 pounds or 10.5 tons. Once again, that didn't go in the landfill. And in addition to that, Avenue of Life also provides uh, furnishing to only Wyandotte County residents who they assist in finding homes for the houseless. And from that, there was two truckloads of furniture that was donated or able to be repurposed. And that was equivalent about 2,250 pounds or about one ton. So combined between the mattresses and donations, about 11.6 tons was diverted from the landfill. And finally, I just wanna acknowledge the staff that assisted in this, this event from the public works and both our parks and rec staff as well. Without this, them, we wouldn't have had a special or successful event as we had. Thank you very much. Good evening, Commission. My name is Sam Herr, uh, the Fiscal Officer for Public Works. Tonight, I have the privilege to talk about um, a new and special way um, within the Fleet Department. The Fleet Internal Service Fund was developed um, in 2021. It's um, accounting that brings accountability to our fleet services. It's not just uh, about how we develop and account for um, our costs, but it's a way to bring um, a shift to our culture in the way we do business. The change is about transparency. It's about identifying how much our services cost and then finding efficiencies within our services. It's about addressing um, really how much it, it takes to do a service and then uh, finding um, ways to improve ourselves. It brings accountability to our staff and it also brings ownership to our users. This also uh, paves the way for our future. It, brings a future that allows us um, to look at other business units um, by themselves and see um, how much cost they are and um, bring benefits to the community um, by reducing taxes to our, our uh, community overall. Um, so thank you for your time. Good evening, Rob Anderson, Public Works Asset Manager. And I'm here to discuss improvements to our storm debris collection process. We utilize an Esri survey app, specially designed for public works debris operations to collect the location, type of damage, size of limbs, and photos. Every storm is unique, assessing the damage, stepping back and tailoring our response for the special circumstances of each storm is key to minimizing the impact on special operations. Our most recent storm debris survey is depicted in this map. Streets crews uh, drove around the section of the county we knew to be impacted and performed a windshield survey shortly after the event ended. Collecting this data allowed us to estimate the extent of the damage, categorize it and strategize our response. Special communications were designed to inform the public about our plan and actions they could take to help crews work more efficiently. The extra time between the event and pickup dates gave residents time to place debris at the curb and minimize the need for crews to backtrack or schedule special pickups. Simply put, being data-driven and systematic in our approach to storm debris pickup saves the UG time and money. Thank you for your time and I will pass it over to Vince. 
Good evening, Vince Balacci, Streets Manager. Uh, tonight we're going to do a high-level overview of winter weather operations. Uh, we're with full commission here soon to go more in depth on this. Uh, we start every year uh, going over all the equipment with fleet services and getting any needed repairs taken care of. Training, we'll uh, do a dry run of all routes prior to the winter. And we also, this earlier this month, did our third annual snowplow rodeo as part of our training program. Priorities, we'll look at more in depth on the next slide. Monitoring, we're constantly monitoring weather during the winter. Uh, we utilize a service called Weather or Not, who gives us a special detailed forecast for our area. And we'll also have a special addition to our program next year, our winter weather program will be pavement sensors so we can monitor the pavement temperatures all throughout the county at any given time. Uh, we start each storm by treating hot routes. These are major roads or any roads with hospitals, police, fire stations, other emergency facilities. Then we move to secondary routes. Those are roads that feed those hot routes from the neighborhoods. And then finally, we have all the residential routes. Uh, some special things you can do to help us out during a winter weather event. Avoid driving during a storm. Uh, the less traffic, the better for all our drivers out there. Uh, avoid parking on the streets. Secure your mailbox. Your mailbox should be able to withstand the weight of the snow coming off the plow. Uh, push snow to the right side of your driveway. That's if you're looking from your house to the street, you wanna push it to the right side. That will help eliminate the snow plow from dragging the snow back through your driveway after you've shoveled. And again, uh, remind kids not to play in large piles of snow in the road or sled in the street. Thank you. This is Troy Shaw, I'm the county engineer, and um, I've been given the special privilege to wrap this presentation up with a topic that many of our residents have a special interest in, which is the Central Avenue Bridge. Um, as almost everybody in here knows, the, this bridge is just over 100 years old, has been closed since last February. Uh, we've noticed, uh, we received poor reports at that time that were, there was some significant damage to the, uh, many of the structural members of the bridge. And due to safety concerns, we uh, decided to close it at that time. Um, since then, we have looked at some options and, and to figure out what we're going to do to this bridge, whether it's repair, replace, remove. Um, all those different options range from four to $60 million. Um, to help determine that, what we're going to do, we've recently completed a uh, traffic study which analyzed the uh, surrounding infrastructure as well as um, routes that would be taken if the Central Avenue Bridge was not there. Um, that includes the James Street and I-70 and then 670 as well um, in this study. Uh, what, we, what we determined from the results of this study was that um, traffic has been flowing um, over the last six, seven months since we've closed it pretty well. Um, the Central Avenue Bridge uh, before COVID carried uh, around 4,700 vehicles per day. And those vehicles have been distributed through the other routes that uh, are made available currently. Um, I also wanna note that we have other structures similar to the Central Avenue Bridge uh, in Wyandotte County. We actually have um, three other major river bridge crossings and then another uh, major bridge over uh, the BNSF railroad tracks um, that are very similar. Um, and we're gonna continue to monitor those so we don't end up in this situation with those bridges moving forward. Um, so based on the results of this study, uh, it's a recommendation of the Public Works Department that from, an, from the engineering analysis that this bridge be eliminated uh, from our uh, infrastructure um, list and uh, move forward with looking at alternatives um, or seeing if we can convert uh, this, this crossing to um, something that may be a specialty crossing to the, uh, the residents. Um, go ahead and flip to the next one, Dave. Um, there's opportunity to convert something to a pedestrian walkway, we think. Um, this would kind of fit in with 
what Melissa was talking about earlier with the levee trails and making that uh, connection and a special place for pedestrians to go. Um, that's all I have. And I just want to thank you for listening to us and, and uh, letting the special team in public works uh, speak. Mr. Fisher, thank you. Do you have any closing comments for us? I do not appreciate your time. All right. Well, let me say on behalf of this committee, several things. Uh, first of all, just for the public observing, you may or may not know that on the mayor's direction, we are divided into subcommittees, each of which is working with this public works team on the variety of issues that were mentioned earlier in the presentation. And so in addition to the work that our public works team is doing each and every day, they're also taking time out of their schedules that are already full to have multiple separate meetings with groups of commissioners, people like me who don't know public works, and so, number one, I've been on a super large learning curve, and they've been very easy to work with and help us learn. It's an interesting balance to have a governing body charged with the large overview of how to spend the funds and that convening of the elected officials directly with this staff I think might be one of the most impactful things that the commission has undertaken in a good long while. So I, for one, am more than appreciative of the time that you are spending with us so that we can work together to try to come to those solutions and those strategies. And I just wanna say, as we close out this meeting, that everything that's been on our agenda tonight seemed like a simple thing and behind the scenes, amazing efforts have been undertaken by our staff to put grants together, presentations together. Everything that we've seen tonight was not a small thing on behalf of this staff. So I just hope that there's some understanding of the work that goes into bringing something to us. And with a simple vote, we approve it, but it is not simple at all. And I am going to call on Commissioner Philbrook and then Mark Lee, please. Thank you, Commissioner Bynum. Um, so public works, um, they are the unsung heroes for sure. And they get to deal with a lot of things that nobody notices unless they're driving over a pothole or complaining about their trash being picked up. So the uh, stormwater and wastewater issues, we take a lot of things for granted until we have something, a street washout or an issue like that. So a lot of these things have been catching up with us uh, because of inaction over the years. and. I want to thank the mayor and administrator and Jeff Fisher for bringing us all together to work on these so we can have an in-depth understanding um, of how to approach and care for our community and to create that long, long-term plan, you know, immediate plan, intermediate plan, and then that long-term, you know, 30 years. Some things are going to take us 30 years. And um I just, the knowledge that I'm gaining from this, I really do want to thank everybody. I do appreciate your help with this and looking forward to continue on with this. So thanks a lot, Jeff. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Markley. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, really great job by everyone who presented tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, I do want to take just a minute to recognize the public works effort at um, culture and at succession planning and, and promotion of leadership skills. Um, I think it's easy to think 
those things are not important, but they're really critical. And they're particularly critical in this job market, which as we all know, is a very, very difficult job market for us to retain for anybody. Um, private sector, public sector, everybody is fighting for employees right now. And if we want to retain the best employees to serve our residents, um, we have to have a workplace culture and a, a leadership centric, um, leadership skills centric uh, department to bring them into. So I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm not sure every department does it as well as you do, um, but I hope you'll be a good example for those departments who have it in the past focused on developing a culture and a, and a leadership plan. So I really appreciate that. Like I said, always critical, particularly critical right now as we fight to retain employees. Thank you very much for all those comments. We appreciate that and your support. Thank you all very much. And both commissioners, those are excellent comments to make and good way to end this particular meeting tonight. Uh, with that, I will say to BPU board member Groneman, as always, we certainly appreciate the time that you take to come and serve on this committee with us. So thank you very much for that. And with that, this meeting is adjourned and I will hand it to Commissioner Mark Lee for Administration and Human Services. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for highlighting us through um, that agenda. We will move on to our Administration and Human Services standing committee agenda. Before I call this meeting to order, I want to announce that due to COVID-19, some committee members, staff, and public are attending remotely via Zoom as well as on site. All participants joining by phone should mute their phones when not speaking to avoid background noise, like the noise of my dog just running from the window during the, <laughs> when you know at the whole last meeting, she was quiet. <laughs> during the meeting, please make sure you announce yourself by name and title every time you speak so the public that is observing knows who is speaking. This is critical given the number of remote participants and is current guidance from the Kansas Attorney General. The public is allowed to participate by Zoom or submit comments by email prior to the meeting and those comments will be included in the record of the meeting. The public may also indicate their intent to provide remote public comment by contacting the clerk's office by 5 p.m. the Thursday before the meeting. The public will also have an opportunity to provide brief comments either by telephone or via Zoom from the lobby of the municipal office building. I will now call the meeting of the Administration and Human Services Standing Committee to order. Would the clerk please call the roll? Roll call, Philbrook. Here. Kane. Here. Ramirez is unable to attend this meeting. Bynum. Here. Markley. Here. There are no revisions to tonight's agenda and our first order of business is the minutes from our August 23rd meeting. Is there a motion for approval of those minutes? Bynum move approval. Kane second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Roll call, Philbrook. Aye. Kane. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Markley. Aye. Thank you. Those minutes have been approved and that takes us to our first item on the committee agenda. Uh, we do have five items tonight. The first one is an update on the district court and Judge Burns is here with us tonight to provide the update. Welcome, Judge Burns. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Commissioner. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, I want to give you a brief update on, on the district court and, and where we are. Um, as you know, we are the 29th uh, judicial district. We are one of 31 judicial districts in the state of Kansas. Uh, I am the chief judge and have been for the last two and a half years. Um, I've actually been on the bench for about 17 years. Uh, and, and some of you may know, though, prior to that, for nine years, I was in the Unified Government Legal Department. So I do have a pretty good uh, working knowledge of uh, not only um, our side of the street, but also the, the UG and, and the legal department. So, um, so the district court is a, uh, obviously a separate branch of the, of the state of Kansas uh, with the executive and the legislative branch. Um, Unified government, however, however, is required to provide certain things to us by statute. So I wanted to kind of update you on that and where we are and where I think we are headed. Uh, the district court has approximately 150 employees. That includes uh, 16 judges who are elected officials in Wyandotte County. 
that also includes administrative assistants, court reporters, clerks, uh, chief ser or court service officers. Um, so we do have a number of people in, in the buildings that we are uh, provided. Uh, obviously, we handle every type of case in the state of Kansas. We handle all the criminal cases, including felonies and misdemeanors, uh, civil cases, which could involve business and personal injury, domestic cases involving um, divorce, child support, child custody, traffic, juvenile cases, uh, probate cases, limited actions, which could be evictions and collections, uh, protection orders, eminent domain, tax sales, adoptions, marriage licenses. Uh, so we, we do provide a, a wide range of, of services to the people of Wyandotte County. Uh, state law does provide certain statutory requirements that the unified government must provide to the district courts. Uh, by statute, the unified government must adequately fund the operation of the district court and is responsible for all expenses except those required to be paid for by the state. The state basically covers our salary and our benefits, uh, but doesn't really pay for any other operating expenses. So the brunt of that would fall on the budget. Uh, by state law, the budget is required to be submitted by me as the chief judge, and it's submitted for approval by the, the Board of Commissioners. Uh, under state statute, the county must also provide security for the district courts as deemed necessary by the Board of Commission. Uh, in our case, the sheriff does provide uh, not only the courthouse security to get into the buildings that we house, uh, but also uh, the courtroom security itself. Uh, and then finally, the county must also provide an adequate, adequate place for court to be held. Uh, we have three buildings, the main courthouse, which is where most of the judges in the courtrooms are and the clerks, the Correctional and Court Services Building, which is also known as the Old Federal Building, uh, that also that has two criminal courtrooms as well as uh, probation. And our new building, the Juvenile Services Building, um, that has uh, the juvenile courts, detention, uh, the juvenile clerks, and probation. Uh, we also, as I indicated earlier, we are relying upon the unified government for the budget. That includes money for jurors, uh, money for attorneys for juvenile offenders, guardian ad litem, sink cases, also attorneys for specialty courts and probate, uh, general supplies and office expenses that we require, uh, process servers. Uh, we also supervise the court trustees who collect the child support. Uh, that is a self-funded department and any capital improvements we need on, on the buildings in which we conduct court. In uh, March of 20, uh, we were shut down like everyone else. However, the Kansas Supreme Court ordered us to continue to operate to provide essential and necessary functions. That was a limited uh, number of matters that we covered. Uh, basically, first appearances, arrest warrants, search warrants, protection orders, uh, and some juvenile matters. We did reopen in late May of 20, uh, 2020 uh, with a limited staff. However, at that point, we were open to the public, so the offices were open for people to come in and, and get what they needed. Uh, initially, most of our hearings were by Zoom. Uh, some of our hearings have continued to be held by Zoom, and we found that uh, certain dockets do function better uh, by having them conducted over Zoom. And so we have we have done so. The Supreme Court's allowed us to do so. And, and so we will plan on doing that for the uh, foreseeable future. However, many hearings are now held in, in person. Uh, the last thing we had to do to resume our normal function were to resume jury trials. The uh, Kansas Supreme Court ordered us uh, to draft a jury trial plan which needed to be approved by uh, the chief medical officer, Dr. Greiner, also by the Office of Judicial Administration in Topeka, and finally by the Supreme Court. Uh, we did have that approved in early 21, 
Because of the conditions of the pandemic, we waited until June to resume jury trials. Uh, however, we've had about 17 trials so far. Uh, most of those have been criminal. I think we've had one civil trial. Everything else has been criminal. At one point, we did have a backlog of about 200 jury trials. However, we have worked our way through that, and I think we're down to approximately 70 jury trials that are set at this point uh, that are criminal. Uh, we have about uh, 50 or 55 civil trials, but uh, we were uh, able to eliminate our backlog through uh, a lot of hard work and, and cooperation with, with everyone. Uh, since we have resumed the jury trials, we really haven't had any issues. We haven't had any trials disrupted by COVID. Uh, I think our plan has, uh, has worked well. Uh, I do appreciate the efforts of the unified government. Uh, Emirate Cross has been very helpful. Uh, the folks at the buildings and maintenance have also been very helpful. Um, so it, it's, it's worked and we continue to, to push forward and get trials done. Um, as, far the, as far as the future, you know, our, our budget has always been, I, I think we've been fair and reasonable. I, I think we've been prudent in how we've used the money. There's been times we've been asked to, to cut back on some things and we've worked with the unified government. So I think uh, there is a good working relationship. Uh, I, I intend on, on continuing that. Uh, but as with anything, there could be unexpected expenses if we end up with an unusual number of trials or a particularly large trial. Uh, so I, I look forward to continued cooperation to make sure that we are provided what we need to, to, to operate. Um, the main things I see are, are some very significant capital improvements, particularly as it relates to the main courthouse. Uh, we need a new roof. We need uh, a new HVAC system and, and new elevators. Um, I don't know if you've been over to this building recently. We've had one working elevator for about the last six months. Uh, fortunately, the, the numbers of people coming into the building are not as they were before COVID, particularly as far as people getting their tags. Uh, so we've been able to adjust, but it has been um, Kind of a burden and, and takes a little while sometimes. Uh, the good news is all those main, um, those three main things are are in the process. They're they're on order or in the process of getting in the budget. So uh, I I think those will get addressed. Uh, and and then that leaves really the um, the correctional and court services building, the old federal building. Um, I don't know if you've been over there. That that building is is in very very poor condition. It has many issues. However, it does have our two largest courtrooms. Our two criminal divisions are over there. Um, and so it's quite necessary for us to have that space or at least have space like that somewhere else. So that's kind of a long-term uh, goal, long-term issue we have. Uh, and I think we would need to develop a plan because Quite frankly, that building just needs some significant work if it's going to continue to uh, to function, and I don't know that that's practical uh, going forward. Um, with that, I, I would be happy to answer any questions that uh, anyone might have regarding our operations and anything else with the uh, district court. Emirate Cross. Madam Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I would like to also echo from our end that we've established kind of a new working relationship with district court services and uh, Judge Burns and Anita Peterson have been very easy for us to work with. We, we deal with some tough big ticket items sometimes and we have such a relationship together that we, we work together to attack these items. And I appreciate them being very reasonable with some of these big ticket items. It's, 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 it's very costly to put a new roof on a building that size. It's very costly to fix elevators, but I, I just wanna pass on that, that I appreciate them working with us to achieve these goals and look forward to continuing this relationship and working with them and solving these issues in the future. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Commissioner Bynum. Thank you, Commissioner Merkley. Your Honor, I could we just step back to the budgeting items just quickly? And it's it's for me and the public both. Um, 
with regard to the district court operation, can you go a little deeper into, I know you gave us some explanation of the ways the unified government financially supports district court operation, but for example, am I correct that salaries of the judges, for example, is a state payment? I mean, you're a state employee, is that right? Correct. Yeah, we we work technically for the state of Kansas. Um, and I mean, a judge is not really an employee, we're an elected official. But yes, we are paid. Our salary and benefits are paid by the state of Kansas. Now our employees are also considered to be um, employees of the state of Kansas, and all of their salary, all their benefits are paid for through the state. So the unified government doesn't contribute any money to their salary doesn't you know, cover any of their benefits. We have our, a separate insurance, separate uh, everything that is paid for through the state. But the way the statutes read, anything other than that, basically, the unified government has to provide us. So you've got to give us a place to have court. We've got to have a courthouse. To run the courthouse, we've got to have phones and computers and copy machines, things like that. Uh, you have to provide security. So we have the sheriff who provides security to not only get into our building, but you know any uh, any security we might need in a in a courtroom. Um, there's certain things also that that the unified government's agreed to pay for. Like we have, um, so like if you're char- if an adult's charged with a felony, we have an appointment list that's paid through the state of Kansas. However, we and this was developed several years ago, we, uh, we have attorneys for juvenile offenders. That's not paid for through the state, uh, and neither are the attorneys for like the parents of the, uh, that have children that are in need of care. So those monies are paid for through, through the unified government budget to, to operate. Um, so basically the unified government has to provide us with everything we reasonably need to operate the courts um, which is other than our salary and, and, uh, and benefits. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I, I just think that I'm not sure I, you know, always have the delineation in place. And certainly I think the public fails to understand. So I think it's just really helpful for you to, you know, share that with us. I don't know that in the big scheme of thing, it really matters, except for the fact that when we're talking about budgeting local taxpayer dollars, it is nice for our community to understand all the components that are included in that. So again, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. And, I, and I'd be happy to answer any other questions about that or anything else. And, and it is kind of tricky because, you know, everybody just sees that we work for the government, but they don't realize that uh, even though we work with un- the unified government, we're not we're not a department of the unified government. We are our own separate branch, and we're we're technically state employees. So. Any other questions from committee members? I'll ask the clerk if any comments have been received from the public. No comments were received. Thanks, Sally. All right, thank you, Judge Burns, for the update. And um, it's, it's always great to hear these updates in advance of the next budget season. So when these discussions happen, we have some background and, and some understanding of what's been going on and, and what you see as upcoming concerns. So I really appreciate your time tonight. That item was for information only. Thanks thank so you. much. And, and if any of the commissioners ever need anything, they, they know where to find me. I'm happy to, uh, to talk with you at any time. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda is amending the schedules of meeting times. And I will recognize Jeff Conway to discuss. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, This is a very simple item. Um, It's the uh, Economic Development Finance Committee would flip uh, its position with the uh, Neighborhood and Community Development Committees. Um, So they just switch and uh, EDNF would move to the five o'clock slot uh, and neighborhood and community development would um, meet immediately thereafter, and that would be for the the rest of the the remainder of the 
of the schedule of the two year schedule. Um, and in order for this to take effect in November was, was the idea, uh, it would need to be fast tracked uh, so it could hit the uh, commission meeting this Friday, uh, this Thursday. Uh, and my understanding is that the uh, uh, Commissioner McKiernan and Commissioner Burroughs have talked this over and, and, and uh, want to do this. And that's about it. Thanks, Jeff. Yes. Yeah, so this, for those who are in the public or um, watching, this is the other set of standing committees. So it's a little weirdness that uh, because we're the Administration and Human Services Standing Committee, we have to approve the other standing committees flipping, flipping their time slots. But it's um, a sort of a change to create some convenience for those people uh, who are not committee members who have to attend that meeting so they can get done and out of there a little more quickly. Are there any questions or comments from the committee members on this item? I am move approval. Holbrook, second. Great. We have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Roll call, Philbrook. Aye. Kane. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Markley. Aye. Thank you very much. That takes us along to item number three, which is request to reallocate returned and unused ESG CV funds to assist in establishing temporary shelters. And Wilba Miller is here to explain what that means. Um, let me hang on just a second. I was not quite ready for you there. Uh, one of our nonprofit agencies that received uh, COVID, ESG COVID-2 funds last year uh, during the RFP process has turned back approximately, well, $293,000 that they will not be using. Um, at the same time, we got a uh, correspondence from a couple of agencies wanting to put together a uh, temporary emergency shelter for cold weather, <clears throat> similar to what they did last year, only have the ESG COVID monies pay for it. So this is just for information only, to, to let the commission know that we will be looking for places, resources, volunteers, staffing uh, to put this in place. They are hoping to put something in place by December 1st for possibly up to six months. Um, mm -hmm. They reported that last year they served approximately 30 individuals. This would not be open every night. It would only be open to uh, the public when it's what I think it was uh, 26, 26 degrees or a little bit higher. I don't remember. 28 now. degrees or below. Okay. So I'm here to answer any questions. Okay, I'm gonna ask a question. Um, I show it as being for a vote. You said for information only. So if somebody could confirm that while Mike Keene is speaking, that would be helpful, thanks. Okay. First of all, I, I, I wanna say, I think that's outstanding. You know, that, that we're in a position with the pandemic and everything else and people being homeless and stuff like that. I, I, I cannot thank you guys enough for, for doing something like this. I hope in the future we can do more. Um, Commissioner, our records indicate that we wanted it for information only. When we went through the RFP process, we did not bring the agencies to commission. They just, it was a competitive process. So this one is just an agency dropping out. And instead of trying to give it out to the other uh, agencies, right now we think that this is a higher priority. If we find that other agencies have money or are not spending their money, we'll go knock on their doors because these funds have to be spent by August the 5th of 2022. And we don't want to give any money back. So. Agreed. Okay. Commissioner Bynum. Thank you, Commissioner Arkley. First of all, thank you, Commissioner Kane, for the compassion that you've shown with your comment. Commissioner Philbrook and I have been in more than one meeting with a variety of the agencies that are really doing everything they can to try and assist this population. Uh, we know how, how brutal last winter was. We hope and pray that it's not that way again, but I'm, I'm so grateful for the forward progressive thought instead of scrambling 
for a shelter, we're planning for a shelter. And, and even though we could have started our planning sooner, we're, we're still going to be able to provide some relief for this population. I just wanted to state that I 100% support it. And Wilba, thank you mm -hmm. for everything you do. And that's it. I should have mentioned there are a couple of semi-related items. So we, we may be commenting um, here on, on, on some of the future items as well. Commissioner Philbrook. Yeah, uh, Wilma. Excuse me. Commissioner Philbrook, I, uh, um, I'll be interested in hearing a little bit more in-depth report back from you guys, and I'm sure I'll be on some other, some other meetings as it reflects, you know, as it has to do with this, but um, I want to know a little bit more in depth, okay, at some point. Yes, right, ma'am. Thanks. Any other comments from commissioners? If not, and, and if this is indeed for information only, we can move along to item number four, um, a resolution to accept federal funds for homelessness assistance and supportive services. Okay. So earlier this year, HUD notified us that we would receive $3,197,000 uh, for an appropriation for what they call the Home ARP or American Rescue Plan Program. Uh, it was allocated to provide housing services and shelter to individuals experiencing homelessness and other vulnerable populations. Uh, they HUD would like us to authorize a grant agreement and uh, with the UG to begin grant planning. And Stephanie Stoffer of my staff is gonna make the presentation to commission. Um, and then we'll answer questions if we can. <laughs> so go ahead, Stephanie. All right, great. Thank you for the introduction, Will. I really appreciate it. Um, good evening, commissioners. I'm really excited to be here to talk about this grant program. I think it presents our community with a really neat opportunity. Um, and now I'm trying to see if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. Um, so Wilma gave a pretty good overview. This is a grant that is coming from the American Rescue Plan Act from HUD. Um, and it is a little bit more than $3.1 million. Um, although the American Rescue Plan has been out there for a while, we didn't get the regulation from HUD until towards the end of September. So we've been combing through that. Um, this program, Although it's similar to the regular home grants that we get on an annual basis from HUD, it is pretty different. And there are um, different populations we can serve and different activities we can do and cannot do. So I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so far, we've attended about six hours of training from HUD and that was just to go over the regulation, like it's very basic. Um, but HUD got a really good allocation of money to do more training and technical assistance. So we're pretty sure we're gonna get a chance to um, really dive into the regulation and um, see what other communities are doing and um, get ideas and things like that. Um, but before we can undertake any activities with this grant fund, we'll also have to permit or prepare and submit an allocation plan to um, HUD. So um, there are two really important things with this grant. So you have to serve qualifying populations and you have to carry out eligible activities. Um, on the screen, there are five qualifying populations. So that is um, homeless is defined um, in HUD regulation. At risk of homelessness is defined in HUD regulation. Um, fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, or human trafficking. Um, and that is defined in regulation and also in some legislation. Um, other families requiring services or homeless assistance per, to prevent homelessness. This is a new definition that um, came out with this program. And also those who are at the highest risk of housing instability, which is also a new definition. Um, the eligible activities under this grant are acquisition, construction, or rehabilitation of rental housing, um, acquisition, construction, or rehab of non-congregate shelter. So that would be a shelter um, facility where um, folks or participants would come in and they would get a private room. Um, and that would also include sanitary facilities that are private. So um, if you think of like hotels, those, you know, you go into your room, you have a bathroom, um, it would be like that. It wouldn't be the situation where there's a large room with the bunk beds. Um, 
We can also pay for supportive services, and there's a very long list of um, services that are included in that, and that's all in the notice. Um, we can do tenant-based rental assistance, um, and we can also do nonprofit operating and capacity building assistance. So that's um, assistance to nonprofits to build their capacity in order to help them carry out these types of activities we're going to fund. Um, and then also administration and planning. Um, so that's our staff time um, and putting together the plan and monitoring the activities and doing all that stuff, um, which is capped at 15% of the grant. Uh, some ineligible activities. So under our regular home program, we really focus on um, home ownership um, in Wyandotte County. And um, so those kinds of activities are not eligible with this program. So we're gonna be switching gears pretty sharply um, with this new home program. Um, you cannot pay for operation costs for a non-congregate shelter. So if we build a non-congregate shelter, we're not allowed to pay for the ongoing operating costs of keeping that facility open. Um, and then we can't pay for supportive services that a participant is already receiving from another source. Um, in order to receive this grant and start carrying out activities, we have to go through a planning process with HUD um, and here are some of the steps that are required. So at a minimum, we have to do consultation and um, this is a list of groups that will have to involve in that consultation. Um, there's quite a few folks that are gonna be involved. Um, we'll have to do um, a data gathering and analysis process where we look at all of the current needs in our community um, and identify the gaps that we have in services. Um, we will select kind of buckets of activities and funding and put together um, a grant budget based on the consultation needs and gaps assessment that we're gonna do. Um, we will have to go through a process to develop appropriate home ARP policies um, and procedures because right now we really focus on home ownership. So we're gonna have to really dig into this and look at um, how these new activities work. Um, and then we'll have to publish a draft of the allocation plan for a 15 day public comment period I'm gonna hold at least one public hearing to get public feedback, um, and that's the minimum. And then once all of that's done um, and we've taken the public's considerations and edited the plan and all of that, um, we'll seek commission approval to submit the plan to HUD. Um, I've listed some websites here in case anyone just wants to learn more about this program. And um, the HUD Exchange is a really good website that has all kinds of information related to HUD. Um, they have some really good quick sheets, quick fact sheets out there that um, describe some of the activities in a little bit more detail without giving you like too much information because the implementing notice is 97 pages. Um, and these are like really quick one sheet kind of deals. Um, the HUD.gov page has some more information. And then there's a link here to the implementing notice. Um, and so that brings us to why we brought this forward tonight which is HUD has directed us to authorize a grant agreement with them. Usually we submit a plan um, and then they approve it and then they let us do a grant agreement. Um, but for this grant, we're working backwards a little bit. They want us to do the grant agreement so they can do some administrative things on their side, set up our treasury account, do those kinds of um, backend things. But then also that will give us access to 5% of the grant to do um, planning activities to get the plan together to submit to them. And that is all I have. I don't know if Wilba has anything she wants to add or. No. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, do you want to get rid of the shared screen? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so if it, Commissioner, if you have any of commissioners have any questions, we'll try to answer questions them. Questions for Stephanie or Wilba? Bynum move for approval. Kane second. Super, we have a motion and a second. I'll ask the clerk if anything was received from the public. No, co no comments were received. All right, roll call on the motion. Roll call, Philbrook. Aye. Kane. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Markley. Aye. All right, team, we're in the home stretch. Our last <laughs> item is a request for approval. Commissioner, mm -hmm. commissioner. Um, real quickly, so I'm I'm hoping that although Stephanie isn't letting us see her right now, Stephanie, are huh? you our new um, go-to person about this program? Are you the one that is going to be diving deep into the into the quicksand <laughs> to take care of this? Uh, 
well, I think, <laughs> I think probably so <laughs> right now. Well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just asking because there's no point in me if I have a question, call up Wilbur and Wilbur and go, well, I'll have to get a hold of Stephanie and have Stephanie call you. So do I have permission to call her, Wilbur? You know, you do, but she may not know everything I know. Well, that's okay. <laughs> I don't know everything either, but hey. So okay. Together yes. we'll learn. Thanks. She Stephanie. will work with it. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. All right. Last item is a request for approval of Mount Carmel Redevelopment Corporation's budget revision. Right. Wilbur is here to present on that as well. Okay, so um, as some of you or all of you may know, Mount Carmel uh, Redevelopment Corporation has managed the Willa Gill Center since November 1 of 2002. And um, they receive annually from the general fund and CDBG funds approximately $260,000, which supports the management of the facilities and the provision of critical services to address housing and food insecurity. The contract includes salaries for the facility director, one case manager, one contracted security officer, one full-time custodian, and one part-time relief custodian. The last adjustment to this contract was in 2018, which was just for security services. So Wilda Gill staff salaries have been and continue to be well below a standard level, which has led to staff burnout, high turnover, and issues in recruitment, especially in the case manager position. Their original uh, request to us was to um, bring salaries up to uh, a marketable living wage and give back pay till the beginning of the year. Um, and then whatever we determined is a fair, if we determine that this is a fair uh, marketable wage for these staff to carry it forward into 2022 and beyond as a budget increase. These are increasing general funds, not community development block grant funds. Any questions? Commissioner Bynum. Thank you, Commissioner Merkley. I just wanna support the uh, approval of this revision. I know that earlier I saw Ms. Andra Penn and I believe Pamela Grady on the call. They uh, are here, Pam Smith or Pamela Smart. Are, Pamela, are here. Smart. Pamela Smart. I went to school with these ladies and I've, and I've gotten their names confused. Um, and Ms. Andra, thank you for everything you do. I spent some time on the um, advisory committee for... Will Gill some years ago, probably almost a decade ago now, but it was a really good learning experience for me to, to come to understand everything that that goes on at Will Gill. And then when you layer on the pandemic, um, you know, it just made the challenge that much more difficult. So thank you to Mount Carmel and those that work at Willa Gill um, for everything you do. I move approval for the revision, please. Are there any other Thanks, questions or is there a second? Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Roll call on the motion. Angela, oh. before, before we do roll call, um, can we uh, just mention some uh, money things like how much that's increased okay. that I meant stuff like that so the public knows what the heck we're talking about okay mount carmel has increased it requested an increase in the 21 contract to bring staff salaries up to this level the adjustment will increase salaries for four qualified employees applied retroactively along with administrative expense and facility equipment totaling forty four thousand two eighty five seventy. okay um then the salary adjustment in 2022 would be for uh, totaling $316,000 versus the 260 that we pay right now. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I'm sorry. I should have said it earlier. <laughs> All right. We do have a motion and a second. Any additional questions? All right. Roll call on the motion. Roll call. Philbrook. Aye. Kane. Aye. Bynum? Aye. Markley? Aye. Thank you very much, Wilba, for that series of items. And that does conclude our meeting for this evening. We are adjourned.
Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.